Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Skeptic Hangout, the place where we sit back, relax, and chit chat about intriguing and sometimes controversial topics through the lens of skepticism. I am one of your hosts, Laura from Unapologetically Me, and I have with me today Richard from the Skeptic Takeout. Today, we are going to be discussing societies. So, Grab your English tea or your amaretto coffee and join us as we talk about the driving force behind everything from what we eat to what we wear to, I mean, if you think about it, who we are. This is episode 51, Societies. This one, I think this episode is more up your street, Laura. You're the kind of resident anthropologist. So, you know, you, you've, you've got an insight. I remember when you were, you were doing work on your degree and you sent a little questionnaire thing out and, and stuff like that. So you, you do uh, kind of work in this area. So what, what would you define society as? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So societies, I think, can be really complex because it could be something as simple as, um, say, like a town or a group. Um, but it could also be as big as um, even like a country or a nation. But a society in general is just a group of people that come together and they kind of like form their own. Um, and I'm going to throw another vague term, culture, right? So things like how they eat, what they wear, what their form of government is. Um, but... If you ask me, um, a society has to reach a certain size before it's a society versus like a community or a group. Um, and that that we could probably spend some time talking about because I don't I don't even know exactly where that line would be drawn. But like your bowling league wouldn't be a society. Right. <laughs> but the town that your bowling league is in would be right. Um, so, yeah, but a society kind of forms like our, our norms, like um what type of language is appropriate um or even just like what language do you speak um what what kind of clothing is popular um or or types of spices or foods so um it kind of establishes norms that get like handed down from generation to generation um but i think honestly like it could be really flexible um like you could have a a, a tribe in south america um that's been isolated from um, the rest of the world. And they can be very small, like maybe just a few hundred people or even like um, a few dozen people. And they could still be considered society. Like they have their own complex rules, governing systems, like ways of doing things. Um, <coughs> so yeah, it has to be really flexible. I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I was listening uh, and several questions were going through my head as you were talking, as, uh, that were changing as you were talking. Yeah. The one I've settled one is on is would would we say then that um, a society is defined more by its characteristics rather than its size? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure, yeah. Um, like you could even say like um, some of the smaller um, like Amish groups or, or um, what's the other one called Mennonite groups when they first started were tiny, right? But they would still maybe be considered societies because outside of the American culture at the time, their culture and their way of doing things was structured, but it was completely different from the wider community and society that they belong to. So, yeah, I, I think so. I think it really depends on um, what do, how does that group function? Does that group function as um, some sort of topical club or are they revolving around a certain um belief system in which case they they maybe wouldn't be societies they would just be communities or groups or do they have their own sense of structure and um <coughs> like their own sense of of um cultural um uniqueness right whether it's how they cook their food um, what forms of technology they use what clothes they wear that kind of thing um that is sort of standard across that group of people I don't know. And I'm just, I'm, I honestly, like we don't prepare for these shows. So I didn't look up any definitions. I'm really just using my own concepts or ideas of what, what a society would be. So I could be dead wrong. Let, let me pick your brains a little bit then. And, and it, is this feeling like an interview, see. Richard? I'm a little intimidated now. <laughs> like, what's going on here? Well, let, let's take a, <laughs> let's take a step back through time. Let's, let's regress. <laughs> we are, what, what, um, because I've, 
I've done kind of the studies. Uh, I'm, I've not done many anthropological anthropological studies. The ones I have done, writ, uh, uh, like go like down the religious religious route and right. like how religion formed and the the kind of how religion came into being and that kind of things. And I've got my own ideas on that. Um, but specifically, put, put setting that aside. How would you say that the first societies formed? Would you say that they kind of came out of, they came together as the hunter-gatherers came together and and settled in, into farmers? Or would you say that hunter-gatherers themselves formed societies? Yeah, that is an interesting question. And I'm not going to give it a direct answer. I'm going to be really, really obtuse and, and beat around the bush a little bit here. But so when we talk about evolution, right? Like there's no... It doesn't happen in steps. It happens in gradients, right? Like small changes um, that compound over a long, long, long period of time. So I think cultures are exactly the same. I think that that culture has its own evolution that we can follow and societies fall somewhere into that. I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure that this could be argued. In fact, I would love to have a conversation with an actual like PhD anthropologist about this um, very, very topic. But um I would say that like culture kind of forms first where there's these like sort of loose um, relationships and bonds and sort of rules. And then society kind of grows from there. And I think the argument can be made that it's the other way around, but I don't think there is a point. I, I think if we were going to say, did society exist at point X, then during hunter gatherer phases of our evolution. Yeah. I think society existed. I think we had bands of people that had, um rules that they followed they had ways of living they passed information on from from one generation to the next but it was sort of structured in terms of here's our belief systems here's our understanding of the world here's how we prepare food here's our language right that all existed way before the agricultural revolution so i would say yeah society is kind of one of those hazy things that sort of emerged as as groups became more complex and I'd be curious to know, oh God, I would really wonder if um, scientists would would say that um, even like we already know that like things like dolphins and monkeys and, and many, many, many different kinds of animals have culture. I would be curious to think to, to find out if they think that some animals have societies like it is a beehive a society. Right. Or it is an ant hill or ant colony a society. I don't I don't know. Um, but I'd be interested to know where that line is um because i don't i don't think i've ever really thought about it in such strict terms of this side of the line is not a society and this side is yeah that's that's really interesting it's it's like I say i've i've only got a a, a very vague understanding of the kind of how things uh, as you say ingredients came to evolve in that way and that is very much from the kind of religious side of things so as far as the cultural side of things, unless it like, pertains to the religious, it's not something I've had any interest in, really. So it's not something I've looked at. How would you say that, uh, and this is an, an interview question. So. <laughs> I know, eventually it's got to turn into a conversation, but hey, I'm good with it. I'm good, keep it rolling. <laughs> how, how would you say that uh, the... The, I don't want to say clash because that in, implies that it's always a warfare, and of course it's not. How would you say that uh, societies influence each other? What are the main characteristics that are passed on when two different societies meet? Oh my and gosh, is there a way to measure it? You you like to ask these questions that have no straight black and white answers, which I kind of love and appreciate, but it means it's going to end up being me talking for most of this podcast. So um, welcome to the Laura Show, everybody. Um, no, no, I really, I did the Buddhist one. It's your turn. I know that's true. That's true. We each have our strengths and weaknesses. Um, but, um, oh my God, I've forgotten your question. Shoot. Cause I was like, oh, no. How, uh, how, how do the, uh, societies, how do two societies oh, how do they interact together mingle and, and influence, influence each other? Yeah, yeah. 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 There's so many different ways. Okay. So, so, um, there are these like broad categories, right? And obviously like conquest or warfare is certainly one of them. And that's kind of the one that we're more taught in school, I think, right? It's always like the Mongols came down and did this and, you know, yeah. the Romans did that. And um, and then the, the, the British colonization, blah, 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 blah. You evil British people, you, right? Um, you're supposed to smile at that, Richard. 
no, I agree. Because uh, if it weren't for you guys, I wouldn't be here. Today. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but that that kind of tends to be how we look back on on history is these big, rapid, violent changes um, of demographics. But there's a lot of different ways that it happens um, peacefully, um, or or even just more subtly. Like there's there's this this term called cultural diffusion, which is just where two cultures come in contact with each other and they share ideas and they sort of absorb this and that from each other. And it's, it's sort of, um, somewhat up to, like, there's no, there's no, um, formula for it. Like when, when culture X meets culture Y, these things will be traded. It, it really depends on, um, the level of exposure to different things. And so it's very, it's very, um, dependent upon the situation, very situational. Yeah. Um, And then there's also things like cultural appropriation, which is when one culture sort of takes over something from another culture and sort of makes it their own. I would say like the, the biggest, most obvious example that we, we talk about a lot um, every year is Christmas, right? How it was culturally appropriated by Christians um, from these other cultures that had these other celebrations around that time. Um, So that's an example of Kind of where it gets it gets taken and and sort of um, the original meanings get lost, the original sources get lost. Um, but a lot of times, what really is happening is just diffusion. Like ideas are just shared. Um, people are exposed to different things. Like I eat a lot of different foods that that we arrogantly call ethnic foods, right? As though like American food isn't ethnic for some reason. Um, so things like Italian and Chinese and Japanese and um, Thai got my favorite is like Indian and Thai. Like I love Indian food and Thai food. Um, Moroccan, you know, so you have all these, these foods from these um, various different cultures that are very distinct. Like you, you can smell something cooking and go like that's Indian food, or at least um, one of the the surrounding cultures that are very close to, to it. Um, yeah, I, I do that very well with Thai stuff because I've spent a lot of time up in Thai Buddhist monasteries uh, nice. for like days and days at a time and eating with the monks and, and all that. So I've, I've become very accustomed to the to the smell of Thai food. <laughs> that is really cool. Thai is one of my absolute favorites. I love it. Um, but what's interesting, okay, so not to get off on a tangent about food, but what's interesting is a lot of these spices that and and types of food and, and recipes that developed from these areas were really, really dependent upon what was growing in those areas at the time, right? Um, so we think of it as like, oh, well, you know, from South America and Mexico, we get like tortillas. And then um, from um, the Middle East, it's naan. And then, you know, we have these various different different ways of doing even things as simple as bread. Right. Um, but but they're these different cultural and it, it depends on what they were growing and what they had available to them. So the spices specifically, um, it's interesting because it's like, well, why is Indian spice a lot of curries? And um, why does... Um, say Spanish use a lot of like chili, chili powders and stuff like that, you know, um, it, it all just depends on what was, um, indigenous to that area in terms of plants. And I think that's kind of cool and interesting. So then as we start to come together as cultures and get exposure to each other, now we're sharing different flavors, different spices, different techniques that we've never been exposed to because that's just not what's in our area. And now, I mean, nowadays things are so mixed up. It's really hard to tell where like bananas yeah. are not like indigenous to America, but they're like such an American staple. It's not even funny. Like every well, American it, child. Well, was it carrots that weren't originally orange and they were a completely right. different color and they were kind of bred to be orange for some yeah, kind of political up, reason? Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't remember the story. I want to say Holland. I could be wrong. It could be a whole different country. So that's my my um, guess off the top of my head. Um, I do know the story though. It was like for their royal... Um, they they made them orange because of the the colors. I I, um, I want to say it's connected to Northern Ireland somehow when the Orange Marches and William of Orange and all that kind of stuff so, that went there because that it, didn't he come from Holland originally as well? I don't know, and that makes me wonder like how many of these stories are just um what are they called? Not wives' tales, but um where they're not necessarily true. But they get kind of this, this, I think this is going to be one that's going up in the uh, <laughs> Facebook fan discussion group. Yeah, I really like, want to know. I want to do the <laughs> research, not just on Google for like, oh, here's this. Um, oh, yeah. urban myth. That's what I was talking about. It, it, it may be just a myth, like an urban myth. Um, but I, I yeah, I had heard it had something to do with Holland. But I can tell you it's not an urban myth that carrots are not originally orange. They're like yeah. yellow colors and purple colors and like sort of approaching an orange color. But that really, really bright, bright orange that was bred into them. 
And when people talk about things like, I'm getting way off topic here, but like GMOs and stuff, we've been genetically modifying food since before the agricultural revolution, since yeah. we first started sort of picking this type of grain. And and because um, we think of agriculture as like, oh, now people own these big, huge farms. Well, guess what? It started with little plots of land where they would just kind of organize the seeds a little bit and then pick this one and pick that one. And it grew into the agricultural revolution. So I would say <coughs> GMO food production was how we got ag- agriculture. <laughs> I, I remember distinctly, and I think I, I, I seem to recall telling this story on the show before at some point, but when my grandma was alive, I went shopping with her to the supermarket one day and I picked some eggs up, some organic eggs up and asked her if she wanted them. And she went, oh, no, I don't know that new fancy organic stuff. And immediately threw my mind to it when, well, everything was organic when you were young. It's not a new yeah. thing. <laughs> it's going back a step. Yeah. I mean, bear in mind, I'm old and this is going back a few years. So like, my grandma was in the 90s when she died. So this is like when she was young. Yeah. We're talking a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, and we don't even realize how recently processed foods are a thing right like um we didn't have a lot of the processes for like i don't know pasteurization for example like that's that's not as old as people think it is right Mm. people used to get their milk fresh and it would go bad right so like it's like drink it or lose it right um we didn't have refrigeration and stuff like that these are all very very new on the the human technological scale um, so it's interesting to see how we get so spoiled. I, I have a very literal mind. So I struggle with the term organic period. I'm like, give me one thing that I eat processed or unprocessed, yeah. pasteurized or unpasteurized. Give me one thing that's not organic, right? Everything I eat is organic. Yeah. So I, I struggle with that term a little bit. <coughs> um, but yeah, we, we have gotten culturally conditioned to things being over-processed and that being normal. And that's, yeah. that's a little odd for me. Um, right, we we are coming up to the commercial break. Uh, after we get back, now there's there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about the kind of uh, expand on what we've already talked about about kind of cultural diffusion, but touch more upon the kind of the, the the peaceful side of it and the integration that way. But I also want to talk about the difference between uh, like, uh, things like the Silk Road which connected many, many different societies. I like how you're Compared... saying this is another history episode. <laughs> Compared... <laughs> I can't help it. Uh, I have to, the, the amount of history study I have to do for my degree. It's just my on religion your mind. Degree, it's just ridiculous. It's just, it's yeah. automatically a thing. But I want to talk about the, the, the kind of Silk Road and, and the, how that connected societies with kind of what you were talking about earlier with the kind of South Americans uh, societies that might be more in isolation that didn't have that great network of of uh, trade. So you know, but after the commercial break, let's let's hit yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, and I wanna I wanna skip over too after the commercial break to talk a little bit about society in a more broad term, like um, how it impacts people and what like what people do to change societies and what societies do to form and shape people. I think that's I think that's the most important aspect of a society is how it impacts us. Um, But yeah, on to commercials. Hello and welcome to the commercials. Uh, We it would be remiss of me not to mention our fantastic Facebook discussion group. Mm -hmm. That place is awesome. The the amount of interaction from you know we've had a lot of new members i don't know if you've noticed yeah. like, recently we seem to have had a lot of new members jump in there but we've still got the old garden those people who have been there from the beginning who still comment they still get in touch with us uh you know i get regular messages from from one guy who's been with us from the beginning who's who's got suggestions and ideas and it's great to have that kind of interact interaction with our audience i love that absolutely yeah i i want to say like um so our audience is growing, um, but the, the YouTube numbers are are still relatively steady, which um, tells me that you people are listening. But if you want to help us out, if you if you enjoy and you like it, um, do us a huge favor and hit the subscribe button because that will help us know that there's people there consistently and help our numbers grow. But it also helps algorithms so that we can make this podcast um, 
bigger and help it reach more people and maybe um, one day be able to offer you guys some more exciting content and do do a little bit more with it. Um, so yeah, if you guys could take a moment right now, hit the subscribe button um, on YouTube. And if you guys are on um, any sort of podcast and you haven't subscribed to it yet, um, go ahead and do that as well. That'd be really helpful because all the numbers together, they all really help. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think um, watching our Facebook numbers grow though is incredibly exciting and the conversations are really, really good. So I would say with this specific episode, I want to see some good corrections come out of this because I know for the first half I was talking out my, my backside and, um, I want to know that I either got it right, wrong, or or what your guys' opinions are. Yeah. And as Laura said, we, we do want to make this, we want to offer new stuff. We want to make the channel grow. Uh, a, a very good way you can do that, as Laura said, was like, subscribe, do the sharing. If you've got the ability to do so, and if you would like to do so, we also have a merchandise store where That's you can good. buy everything. You can buy cups. You can buy... In fact, I noticed I did a little bit of work with uh, Josh Entner from the Bloody Good Film Co- Podcast the other day, and I noticed in his hand was a skeptic hangout mug. So th- that stuff is there to buy. Podcast you know, crossovers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, buy, you know, go and support us because the more support we get, the more financial support we get. Uh, you know, we can help this channel grow. We can buy new equipment. At the moment, we're using like free software to broadcast. You know, if we can, can pay it. for yeah. subscriptions to things, yeah. It, it makes it so much easier for us and it gives us, it gives us a chance to make a better show for you. And that's ultimately what we want. We want to take it from this kind of little little idea. We've got this little cozy idea we all had a year or something ago to, to kind of making a proper production of it. And we can only do that with help and support. So if you're inclined to do so and you want to uh, go out and advertise the show by wearing a, a hoodie or a T-shirt and walking around the street and, and letting people know about us that way, because that would be amazing. And if you have mm-hmm. bought clothing from us, this is like a turning into a monologue about <laughs> This is an infomercial if you, now. <laughs> if, you, if you have bought uh, uh, like clothing from us, if you are out and about, please take a photograph of it and take a, take a photograph of yourself in it and post it to our group because that would be amazing. I would love to see someone walking around New York City in a skeptic hangout <laughs> T-shirt. That would make or even day. Piedmont, North Dakota, <laughs> dude. Let's make this happen. I love it. No, that's a great idea. Um, if this uh, is your first yeah. time listening, you can find all of our stuff on Linktree, um, which is Linktree forward slash Skeptic Hangout. So, um, if you just happen to stumble across us and you want to know where to find us or where to find that lovely merchandise that Richard was just talking about, um, yeah, check out our Linktree because all of our stuff is there. Yeah. Right. Back to the show. The show. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's my turn to quiz you, Richard. So you've been you've been nailing me with the questions left and right. What society? When did it start? Man, like I'm starting to sweat. So um, let's let's start talking about. You were talking about cultural diffusion and the Silk Road, and the Silk Road is very, very, very um, integral in spreading ideas. Um, so and culture and practices and all kind of food, clothes. So yeah, tell me how the Silk Road impacts society. Well, I I think the 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 Silk Road was, uh, and this this may sound dramatic, but I think it was integral to the, the development of the human race on the whole across the world. I think it was that important. It stretched all the way from China to Egypt and Africa, and it's it it's it literally spread ideas. It spread trade. It spread commodities. Uh, it informed wars. Uh, you know, uh, the places along the Silk, Silk Road became like vital fortresses to protect it and to protect commodities. It was vitally important to, to the development of, of the human society as a whole. But uh, one thing it allowed to do as well, I mean, and I, I'm thinking specifically like from an Islamic perspective here, Muhammad's first wife was a trader. Yeah, she travelled up and down the Silk Road, and he travelled with her for a lot of that time and learnt a lot of that trade. And you know, 
some of the criticism that I have against Islam are based on that because a lot of Muslims will say, well, you know, he, he couldn't have known about uh, Medina. Uh, sorry, he couldn't have I forgot the, the place. Mecca? Uh, it's, no, big in Oh, Jerusalem? One. Jerusalem, that's Yeah, yeah, all. yeah, because he went to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, Jerusalem. He, he couldn't have known about Jerusalem. How can I forget that when I'm a religion student? <laughs> Jerusalem, <laughs> not important in religion. Um, he, he went to uh, he went to uh, uh, the story is that he went to Jerusalem, and he couldn't have known the details of it uh, unless he had this miraculous journey there. But of course, it he must have at least heard stories about there. It was it was traveling around with his wife, who was a, a, a accomplished trader for many years. She was a merchant. And, she owned her own business. Yeah, yeah so we're talking she, big, she, big time travel. He would have heard of the at least of the stories, if not been there himself, and and this kind of this this retention of 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 details like that to try and make the miraculous stories sound more plausible, I think is hugely dishonest in religion. But regarding the Silk Road, what do you think the uh, the impact of it? I mean, of course, it had a huge impact, but what do you think the impact of it? W- is for kind of spreading those ideas compared to these uh, religious, to these societies who were rather static in comparison. And I'm not saying that they did had no trade or, or no interaction with the outside, but the you know the the South American societies, for example, that you mentioned earlier, that were they were kind of you know there were the Mayans and the Inca, that, but they were very insular. They, they traded amongst sort of, themselves. Yeah, sort of. But actually, like, that's that's almost almost wrong. Like, it wasn't as substantial <laughs> as... I mean, it is wrong. <laughs> it wasn't as substantial as the Silk Road. I, I would agree with you that the Silk Road was very, very, very important. And I think it had a lot to do with... Um, oh, what is it called? Ge- geography. And just where the, the um, societies just happened to establish themselves and how they were able to trade up and down the Silk Road. Um, but there were other forms of trade going on before then after then during then and it, it's just it's a substantial one for our particular history but it's not the only the only um form of this like really substantial cultural diffusion um based on trade so like the mayan civilizations they have um they have evidence of trade all up and down south america and they can actually date yeah. like where not date um they can do tests to show where things came from so they're able to show, um, and the, the, the best one that they have that intrigued me the most is um, obsidian, right? They can actually do testing on the obsidian to find out exactly what mine it came from because every single type of obsidian has a slightly different chemical mi- makeup, right? Like right. a little bit of ions of this here or elements of that there. And it, they're all different um, depending on where that obsidian um, grew, so to speak. So they can actually show by finding these arrowheads and these obsidian products up and down South America where trade likely happened. And we're talking thousands of miles. Like we're, we're not talking about like just a neighboring village. We're talking about pretty substantial yeah. trade. Um, they did have civilizations like full on cities, civilizations, technologies, like people don't realize like the, the um, pyramids in South America took effort, took work, took, took yeah. collaboration, took intelligence, right? They're just as complicated. Um, And so there's this sort of misnomer that's like, oh, indigenous people, like I'm using that in quotes because that seems to be like the catchphrase, like people who are in smaller bands of tribes, well, that's South America and America. And then the civilized people, that's Europe and Asia and um, Egypt and like Northern Africa and stuff. And then you get down to Southern Africa, oh, back into tribal, right? That's not, that's not really how it was, right? Yeah. So there was some pretty complex cultural diffusion happening in South America that was really fascinating. Um, and signs of like warfare and stuff between great civilizations, like substantial warfare. So um, they had to have had the means to travel. They had to have had the technologies to fight each other, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the trade routes are really fascinating. And, and watching how they can trace the obsidian up, up the coast um, is really fascinating because it shows that's that something I'm going to have to look into more. And thank you for yeah. showing me I was wrong because I like that. Um, I, um, I don't think it was as far along as the Silk Road, though. Like, don't <coughs> get me wrong. I'm not comparing the two in terms no, of no, um, no. impact, I, but yeah. I, 
Oh, well, but just before we leave the Silk Road, like we're actually on it now, like the Yellow Brick Road, I, <laughs> I think I just want to give one indication because I, I don't think people realise just how substantive it was and, mm -hmm. and the impact it has. Shortly after the time of the Buddha, so we're talking 2,200 years ago, a long time ago, the Greeks were in northern India. There's evidence of the, the Greeks were one of the first people who actually recorded in writing stories of the Buddha. So this is how impactful this thing was. This wasn't just a, a, a kind of non-impactful trade route. This was vital to the development of super, human. Super vital. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, especially in terms so of... I was going to say, especially in terms of sharing ideas like religious ideas and cultural ideas that we still kind of adhere to today, like it was, it was pretty substantial. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of uh, societies mingling because we, as, as we've talked about, we we've we're taught in history quite a lot about the subjugation subjugation of one society over another, mm -hmm. but. What we tend to forget is this isn't just a case of a society going, a country or a civilization or a society going and taking over another one and, and that being the first impact they've had. These places are usually mingling with each other. They're trading with each other. They're living amongst each other for hundreds of years. Uh, just, you know, so this is kind of how... Uh, these things kind of naturally diffuse, like you were talking about cultural diffusion, mm -hmm. and and that, that spreading of ideas doesn't always come through, or doesn't solely come through war warfare. So, can you tell us anything mm -hmm. about cultural diffusion? I think we've only got about five minutes left of the show, so let's let's like <laughs> spread through this quite quickly. Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, so I just want to put it in today's terms because it's really easy for people to understand, right? Like we have um, a worldwide. Um, like we're all kind of connected right now. We have airplanes and boats and, and we have the internet and social media and, and stuff like that for sharing of ideas and people traveling to and fro. So you have um, like, let's just take boba tea, for example, right? Like I go to my mall in rural Nevada and I can drink boba tea, which was developed, I think in Japan. Um, and I don't, I don't, I say, I think, because I don't know if that's where it originated or if it's just popular among um, the, the Japanese culture and it just got, it just got diffused over to America too. So I don't know the source of it, but, um, but that, that isn't a strictly American beverage, right? Um, or you have, um, oh, like different, like I have teens, so video game trends, right? You have Korean games that are adapted to American use, right? And the original game, it's always better in the original, like whoever developed it first, like same thing with anime is right. It's always better in the original Japanese or Korean <laughs> and it's, than it is in the dubbed English version. Right. But those are just ideas that are just shared. They're just picked up and we, we can do it today because we have so much connectivity. And so, um, cultural diffusion today, um, it happens at a really rapid pace and it happens in like these weird and interesting ways where, um, like we have what we think is a distinct American culture, for example. But if you start looking into all these individual things, like, well, this came from France and that came from India and that came from, you know, like uh, China or, or wherever, right? Um, like some of my favorite food, uh, like I have a friend who's Filipino and she loads my freezer up with Filipino food and like it's distinctly different from any other form of food, right? Um, it has its own flavors and stuff, but I wouldn't have access to that stuff if we didn't have such a connected um world right now so it happens very just um it's like the more you're exposed to a thing the more likely that it will change you or you'll change it or whatever so the more that cultures see each other can interact with each other can travel to each other's you know hometowns um the more that ideas and um clothes and flavors and and that kind of stuff are shared so I think I think and today, it doesn't have to be like grandiose things either. No. I mean, if we look back to kind of the eighties, where and I, I'll, I cannot remember the name. This is another thing that's going in the group afterwards. There was there was kind of a trend, and I, and I think it was in Japan 
of uh, kind of transforming robots in the 80s, which never yeah, took off. Yeah, Robotech and, and then, Voltron, those were all, and, yeah. yeah that's the one. And then, then, and then the kind of the Transformers picked up on that, the mm-hmm. mix of the Transformers, and it took off. And that was, like, culturally, it's been quite significant. Yeah. But, you know, for people like of my generation who grew up with those things as kids, they're like... We're informing our children about them and the, the like those and the teen, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. It's all stuff that crosses boundaries, Star Wars, and it's, it's stuff that crosses generations. And it's 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 hugely important, you know. And and yeah, it's as, as culturally, and so, and as far as what in what uh, influences society and the way it goes and things. Yeah, if you if you look at just. Um media like movies cartoons and stuff like that you see that cultural diffusion back and forth like you just named like you know robotech and voltron and transformers and all of that and like he-man kind of takes away from like the style like we have an american style of cartoons from the 80s don't get me wrong um but it borrows from a lot of the the anime styles of the the early 80s anime cartoons there's a lot of diffusion and crossover but then you talk about like star wars and star wars is now worldwide across like every 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 industrialized you know country has some yeah. some concept of what star wars is at the very least if, if not like complete fandom right um but that's just that's a really really good example of just how one one piece of a culture like just their entertainment can spread all over the place i know my kids went through a k-pop phase which is like korean right and um and that is now becoming or maybe it's already passed i don't know because i can't keep up with all these trends but it became popular <laughs> for a while in america um, and I, I think it probably still is, to be honest. I've just I lose touch with like um, what's popular and what's not because it changes so rapidly. But um, that's that's I think that's a really, really good example. Um, and that's only one small piece of the pie. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think that when cultures become very isolated and unmoving and unchanging, like the, the one that pops to my mind is like. Um, uh, oh, and then I just forgot what they were called. Amish, like Amish communities. Yeah. Um, they have deliberately blocked out a lot of that, but what I would call progress or, or cultural evolution, like the ability to shift and change and, and take in new ideas and new concepts and stuff like that. Um, they've decided to kind of pause history at a certain point and not move beyond yeah. it. And you don't, you don't get a lot of progress that way. You, you end up staying like generation for generation of generation. They don't just repeat what they think works for them. They repeat everything, including the stuff that doesn't work for them. There's no yeah. creativity or innovation. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and on that note, we we are pretty much on the end of the episode. That I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this. Yeah. I, it, it, this has been one of those where I thought, where the bloody hell are we going to go with this? We, are going, we have nowhere to go with this. And it's, it's just been really interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is, this is a, a really interesting conversation. And we didn't even really get into um society and how it impacts the individual which is probably a whole other hour worth of content but yeah so i I would love to take that to the facebook page so all you listeners um definitely based on anything that we've said throw your two cents up there throw your questions throw your comments your corrections um let's let's keep this conversation moving on facebook but also i would be really interested in posting some questions to the facebook page or maybe some comments about um uh, societies and how they impact the individual and shape the individual. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll generate really some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be my, my homework assignment for this week to get up on Facebook. will be at least a couple of posts that will, will um, hopefully generate some conversation. Yeah. Okay. McGee, final thoughts on society. Um, I think it's, it's one dynamic part of what it means to be um, a evolved monkey. Um, so it's, it's definitely complex. It's emergent. It's ever changing doesn't belong necessarily in a, in a well-defined box, but there's a lot that we can say about it and how it impacts us. Um, I think it's critical for our continued evolution and development um, in order to have that cohesion. Um, but there's also some bad things about it um, that we didn't even get into either. So, oh. yeah. I have nothing to add. Let's. <laughs> what a captivating Let... ending return. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's me, Mr. En- Mr. Enig- Enigmatic. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you all for listening jumper. yeah <laughs> it's been a fun episode um 
I look forward to the Facebook discussions and we will catch you both all next time. I almost said both. We'll catch Thank you, all you guys. Next time. See you soon. <laughs> Bye.